Hello and thanks for joining us. This week we examine the twists and turns of the government's handling of the GCSB spy agency and its unlawful surveillance of Kim.com and his crew. The Prime Minister John Key is ultimately in charge of the Government Communications Security Bureau. After revealing the nation's spies had been breaking the law, the Prime Minister ordered a report by the Inspector General of Intelligence. He has also received an initial review of the GCSB process. But has the Prime Minister's handling of this affair been satisfactory? New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters says it has not. He joins us now to examine this scandal. Uh, Mr Peters, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Uh, we're into our third week now of this uh, GCSB unlawful surveillance yeah. uh, scandal. Uh, the Prime Minister's called a, uh, an inquiry in the sense from the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and also there's been an initial review return on the processes around the GCSB's handling. Are we any closer to the real truth on what's gone on in this issue? No, we're not. It's a bit like a, a remake of Watergate where the expression was uh, what the President didn't know and when he didn't know it. And this is what's happening here. And those inquiries are in-house and they will not be satisfactory because of that. Mm. How would the public interest be satisfied in this whole affair? Well, uh, the public interest, including the need for certain secrecy because of the international ramifications, could be uh, satisfied by, for example, the Ombudsman's Office doing the investigation. Mm. And people would trust that, but they will not trust what's going on now because we've already had NASA inquiry. Uh, Paul Nasa, as you know, is part of that system. Mm. Uh, then you've got the so-called police inquiry. Well, no one's going to be satisfied about that. Seeing on day one, they came out and supported uh, D.I. Wormold. Uh, and now uh, he is expecting the public to believe it'll all go away. Well, it won't because Mr. Key knew things when he said he didn't know them, and that has not yet come out in the uh, magnitude of what we know is the case. So an ombudsman's one option there would, um, like I think the Labour Party has been pushing ahead for a person like Anand Sachinan, former Governor General, someone mm. obviously who has the respect of the public, mm. um, to come to the fore in this type of thing. W would that be another course that would be satisfactory? Well, we said, I said so from the word go that uh, you look to the ombudsman or somebody like the ombudsman and he would be a recent ombudsman capable of doing the job easily, uh, but also to satisfy our international connections and not threaten that certain secrecy provisions, which after all, <laughs> this is an evil world and we do need to have some surveillance of what's going on, but in a way that's lawful, and this was not lawful. Um, and there were concerns obviously that came through last week when uh, the review of the GCSB uh, announced that there were three other uh, instances mm. that may be unlawful, which is starting to actually put questions around what kind of governance and oversight is the Prime Minister providing for his intelligence agencies, but specifically with the GCSB. Um, you have been a, uh, a politician since mm. 1978, yes, uh, with a couple of um, uh, brief uh, interludes in between. Um, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, uh, you've mm. been Treasurer, you've been Foreign Minister, etc. Um, mm. how, how do you compare um, what you are seeing from the outside of the executive at this stage to any other period of Prime Minister leadership over intelligence agencies? Well, I've never seen a Prime Minister claim not to know what was before him because these issues are very serious. Uh, GCSB does not come to see you, and I was the Acting Prime Minister and also uh, frequently briefed when I was Foreign Minister. Uh, they don't come before you to talk about climate change mm. or global warming. They come to talk about the issue which is written out, uh, all typed up, very secret, and uh, your job is to look at it and ask questions. And the number one thing you ask is, so who is the person under surveillance here? Uh, and why do you, do you think it's warranted? Now, the Prime Minister claims after over 15 interviews not to have an, even have discussed the issue. That was his answer to me in the House. It was not true. How deep do those briefings go as far as detail of the operation is concerned? Well, seriously deep. Mm. Uh, they say when, where and why. So does that raise a question on whether or not the Prime Minister reads his briefings? Oh, I believe he read them, uh, and um, uh, he, because you could not. I've never heard of a Prime Minister not taking this seriously, uh, and I believe that the claim to not have read them is the same claim as the Banks case. He deliberately did not read the police report in the Banks case, so he could answer the parliamentary questions by saying, I haven't read it. Well, see, this is an unfortunate event for John Key in the sense that right prior to revealing this unlawful surveillance, mm. he'd been taking a, a line where I am not a forensic analyst, um, so why mm. would I want to read a police report into John Banks? 
Um, and it kind of raises the questions of whether or not he has a want to read the detail. Um, there's been accusations that our Prime Minister is too lax, too relaxed, the kind of person perhaps you'd want around a barbecue. Is that the kind of person perhaps with those personal attributes that have been popular but are not necessarily satisfactory to be in charge of an intelligence agency? Well, you can pose as the oh shucks Prime Minister, you know, the sort of good old boy with a beer in the hand at the barbecue, but the fact is you're the Prime Minister. And I believe he did know because you have to be totally uh, beset with amnesia and total unawareness to not observe that this man was in your electorate. Crikey, he bought the f biggest palatial mansion you could possibly imagine, perhaps in the country, just down the road from his electoral office. He has a $500,000 to $600,000 rocket display on one his day, the day of his uh, celebrating his residency. Uh, he uh, put $10 million into government bonds. All the screams out that uh, when other ministers all knew, including the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Immigration, the Minister in charge of the Overseas Investment Office, that the Prime Minister had to know. And it's coming out that now, twice in Parliament, uh, and one apology is coming, he's already given me one already. That's an, that a is correction in a sense, isn't it? For, for um, an infactual kind of statement to the Well, House. he made a statement and I thought that cannot possibly be correct and I pursued it in question time. And he came back that day at quarter to six in the evening, when no one was there, of course, mm. to say that he got it wrong. And he, as he said, to sort out the questioner's confusion, namely mine. Now, the person who was utterly confused was himself because he, in, in the day, in the question time in the afternoon, he misled the parliament. And he's done it again on that 15 briefings from GCSB. In the House, mm. um, you called for the Prime Minister to sit himself, basically. Well, uh, what I said was, if any other minister had been uh, guilty of your type of uh, behaviour, you would have sacked them. So, Prime Minister, apply the same ruling, sack yourself. So, once again, and go back to that thing, would you have observed this type of uh, style of prime ministerial leadership relating to the intelligence agencies from, say, David Longy or Geoffrey Palmer or Jim Bolger or Jenny Shipley or Helen Clark? Have any of those, do you feel, have performed at a, at a, at a rate or at a standard where you would say you've got to sack yourself? Well, that's the precedent, and numerous precedents, and none of them would have behaved this way. So he's in really serious trouble now. Uh, because he has posed as the great manager. Now on a national interest point of view, we understand that in mid-September, uh, immediately around the time when the Prime Minister announced that unlawful surveillance had taken place by the GCSB, mm. uh, we understand that members of the Five Eyes Echelon Network, uh, representatives of the intelligence agencies mm. from the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, mm. came to New Zealand. Um, mm. What does that say to you? When, and, and the timing around that. Well, Five Eyes is big news. Five Eyes is serious. It means you're in an intelligence club of trusted democracies, uh, and we're proud to be part of it. It, it elevates us as a country. No way he, he couldn't have known about that. Now, of course, this is the, the governance and the mm. government's handling of it, um, the GCSB, mm. and it's already put its hand up and says, yes, we committed an unlawful uh, offence here relating to our surveillance. Um, the other factor in this is obviously the police. Mm. Uh, and the police's handling of it, the police's request to the GCSB, the information the police gave across. How is the public interest satisfied with respect to what we already know and perhaps what we do not yet know? This story is very much alive because the public interest is not satisfied. It's not going away because of that. The public knows there's much more and what's uh, being used by way of constructive devices to avoid disclosure and to avoid the further inquiry has only exacerbated the situation. So what we saw there with the police for the viewers' um, benefit was, was the, the, the police um, uh, seeking the GCSB to, to um, do surveillance on Kim.com. Mm. Um, what we saw in the High Court in early August was um, this Detective Inspector Grant Wormald uh, admit that a New Zealand agency but, uh, was involved with the planning aspects um, then he, he said that he could not name that agency because well, of well, secrecy well, well, reasons. Well, first he said no other agency was involved. And then he got pressed later on and he, met the, he admitted there was one. And then mm. um, when he was asked if any other surveillance had, had mm. occurred at the hands of another party outside of the police, mm. he said no, there wasn't. Mm, that's right. Uh, in quotes, what does that say to you in light that we now know that the GCSB took part in surveillance? 
Well, it means uh, that DI were mould and the police will have a very hard job to dislodge the uh, allegation that this was perjury. So it, an apparent perjury? Or would, would if it, I mean, you're, you're a lawyer mm. as well. Uh, do you see any possible defences around that that could be upheld in the courts? If it was taken to court? <laughs> well, you should never, as a lawyer, rule out there may be a possible defence, but it's not apparent now. Mm. The other uh, I'd like to hear what it is. The other aspect is the police commissioner has mm. come out publicly mm. in support of uh, that particular officer and his mm. statements and the credibility of the team. Do you feel that that's premature uh, from Peter Marshall, the Commissioner of New Zealand? Well, it's A, premature, and B, it should rule out a police inquiry because they've already judged it to be innocent. That's why they are horribly compromised in terms of an inquiry, and surely the Cabinet and Mr Key understand that. So an, uh, uh, an inquiry into the GCSB and the government's handling of it should be extended to the police involvement too, do you believe? Undoubtedly, yes. And, and once again, would that be satisfied by either route an ombudsman and or uh, an appointed person like Anand Sachinan? Well, first of all, with appropriate terms of reference, nothing like was given to Paul Mazer to try and make a finding on. That was as narrow as anything. And then second, you've got to have a personality in whom the public can have trust. Those two things need to be satisfied. And we have the capacity within this country to provide that sort of person. Mm. With, with, with respect to um, the Prime Minister's own situation relating to his handling, and, and you've seen Prime Ministers in action for many years, do you believe that he will now backtrack in the weight of a public demand and political demand from the opposition benches for a proper inquiry to take place? I believe so, because there is more coming and he will not be able to refute or deny it. What methods and what mechanisms, will, and what, what arguments will have to be put before them again, meaning the government again, to make sure an inquiry would take place? Well, the vehicle so far has been to ask the Prime Minister what he knew and he claimed it to not know anything. That has been rebutted twice now and there's more to come. So, uh, and as these things build up, then the only recourse for him to dampen this is to call for full public inquiry and then plead there's inquiry underway so I can't answer questions. I would have thought that would have occurred to him a long time ago. What would you expect to, is it premature to kind of give an indication of what you could expect an inquiry's terms of reference to be? Well, you know, frankly, you'll, you'll have lawyers and others who will be better of a capable of answering that question, but it should be uh, uh, the terms of reference which will get at the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's what the objective should be. And if the government does not satisfy that call, what does that say to you with respect to its respect for the public and national interest? Well, an inadequate inquiry will get the inevitable response. No one will trust it. Thank you, Mr Peters. Thank you. That was New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters. Coming up, we will examine the police's role in the GCSB's unlawful surveillance with renowned defence lawyer Peter Williams, QC.